So let's talk about power diagrams. So we can spend a little bit of time, just a, the ever slightest bit of time, talking about what a power, di power diagram is. You're going to learn more about that uh, later when you take like the audio electronics class and stuff like that. But basically what we're trying to do here, let me, let me show you the one. This is the diagram I'm going to have you make. The idea behind power diagrams is that you uh, Maybe so far in your life, you haven't had to think so hard about where electricity came from. Uh, it's just, you know, you just have to look around and there's usually a little socket on the wall that you can plug into and there's electricity. Uh, and, and that's totally fine for most things. But uh, when you're working on uh, shows like this, sometimes... Uh, well, you, you know, you're suddenly bringing in a whole lot of equipment. You know, sound is bringing in equipment, lighting is bringing in equipment, MoCo brings in equipment, you know, lot, you know projections brings in equipment. Uh, and suddenly everybody's trying to get power for things that aren't usually in that room. And that can cause you a lot of problems if you don't think about it ahead of time. Because particularly for sound, uh, you know, the way sound equipment works is it gets that electricity from the wall and it uses that electricity uh, to uh, represent your sound. So it pulls that electricity from the wall and then it kind of messes around with it to create that audio signal. And so if the electricity it's pulling from the wall has a problem with it, if it's like messy for some reason, then you're starting with something messy that then you craft into your audio signal. Uh, and that can cause, uh, you know, things like distortion. It can cause hums and buzzes. Uh, and the way that things get messed up is if you're sharing power with, like, lighting, for example, is, like, the worst offender for us, is, you know, if, if the, the power, the difference between messy power and clean power, uh, it's not as big of a deal for them. Like, the light usually still turns on. Uh, but the difference between clean power and messy power for us is the difference between having good sound and bad sound. So uh, we have to be really careful about sharing our, our power sources with other people. So that's one thing you want to make sure of is that you're keeping you know, your power separate from the other stuff. But the other thing you got to think about is you know, the electrical, electrical codes require that um, you build in all of this uh, break, what we call breaking capacity. The idea is that if you screw up with electricity, you can actually burn the building down. And, uh, you know, theaters and fire really don't mix very well. Uh, there have been a lot of really famous theaters that have burned down in history. Uh, and fire is just a really, really bad idea generally in theater. And so whenever we do have to use fire, like in a show, that's why we have to have a fire marshal in the building standing there, making sure that we don't burn the building down because theaters just really don't handle fire very well. You know, we've got curtains all over the place that can catch on fire, and then we pack all these rooms full of hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. Um, and, you know, we've got these massive air conditioning systems that, you know, would accelerate the fire as it goes around. So fire is really bad for theater. And one of the ways that you can cause a fire is by screwing up with your electricity. Uh, because if you try to put too much current through uh, a wire, electrical wire, that's running through the wall, that wire, uh, and this is true of just every, generally everything in sound, okay? So because we use, you know, the difference between sound and audio is that audio is sound in electrical format, okay? So audio is sound that has been converted into electricity. Uh, and so... When you're working with audio, that electricity can be used to do two things. It can be used to make sound, or it can be used to make heat. And usually you're going to have a combination of those things. So like, you know, when you blow a loudspeaker, you may have heard that term before, what's usually happening is you got to this place where you were making more heat than sound, and, uh, and so the loudspeaker got too hot 
or the amplifier gets too hot because there was an efficiency problem there. Well, the same thing can happen for the wire. So if you put too much current, electrical current, through a wire uh, that is more than that wire is designed to handle, then you know, that wire, its job is to, is to move that electric, electricity down the wire. It's trying to move it from one end of the wire down to the other end of the wire. And if you try to cram too much electricity through that wire, it's going to say, ah, I can't handle all of this. I can't move that much electricity this quickly. And so some of that electricity, if it's not moving down the wire, it just becomes heat. It just heats up the wire. And eventually, that heat, if, it, if that goes on too long, that wire will literally catch on fire uh, and cause an electrical fire inside the wall. And if that happens in your theater, you burn the theater down, and that's really bad. It happens in your house, you burn your house down. Uh, so electrical codes uh, require that you build in all these things called breakers. And the idea behind the breaker is that if for, for whatever reason too much current starts getting pulled through a certain wire, more than that wire is designed to handle, then there's this sort of, uh, there's this little switch somewhere in that line that will, it, it used to be a, a, what's called a fuse. And the fuse was a little bit of, of it was a really delicate wire that was sealed inside of, you know, uh, an airtight, you know, glass tube or something. Uh, and it, that little piece of wire would literally blow up. <laughs> like it would just explode inside of that little glass tube. Uh, and because it explodes, it breaks that, the, the circuit, right? So now there's air where there used to be a wire that would, tra that would transfer the energy. So this little teeny you know, delicate wire would just blow up. Uh, and if it blows up inside of that little glass tube, no fire, <laughs> okay? So that little wire would blow up before the wires inside the walls blow up. Uh, so it used to be fuses. Nowadays, it's breakers, so it's a little switch. And usually there's a, a, few, a breaker panel somewhere. There's probably lots of them. There's, there's one in your house, uh, guaranteed. Uh, there's, in theaters, there's several. They're all over the place. And uh, there are these little switches that you can actually manually switch them on and off. So if you just want to turn off power to all of the sockets that are fed by that circuit, you can just flip that switch on the breaker panel. No electricity on those panels, which is helpful if you want to like fix the connector on the wall or something. Uh, but the, the other thing about these, these switches is they are breaker switches. And they, these are switches that will automatically switch themselves off if too much current starts flowing through them. And that'll help keep things from catching on fire. So one of the things you have to make sure of is remember, you're going to bring racks and racks full of equipment into this theater and start plugging them into the things on the wall. Well, those sockets on the wall get their electricity from a circuit that has a breaker on it. And that breaker will shut the power off when too much current gets pulled from it. And if it decides that, it, that that needs to happen and it shuts off the power, guess what happens to your sound? It goes away. You don't have any sound. Suddenly in the middle of the show, uh, no sound for you because it tripped the breaker. Uh, and that's really bad. That's happened to me before. And it's not a fun thing, especially in the middle of a performance. Uh, so. You really, really, really don't want to be in that situation. So part of How what you're- How would you go about fixing that? What's that? How would you go about fixing that? Like if you were just to lose power? <laughs> like uh, <how> to... <laughs> well, you know, so that's one of the things the power diagram can help you with is if you know where everything gets powered from and you realize, oh, my amp rack went down, but my mixing console is still on, then you could look at your power diagram and say, well, which breaker feeds the amp rack? And you could go and see if that breaker is tripped. Uh, and the first thing you would do is just try to turn the breaker back on. And if it trips again, then, you, then what I would do is I would start by saying, all right, I'm going to turn off some non-essential amplifiers. Right? So maybe, like, maybe you've got all these amplifiers for like surround sound effects. Just turn those off. Uh, and then try to reset the breaker and see if you can get through the show that way. Um, because it could be you're pulling too much current. Uh, but more likely what's happening is, is that there could be like a wiring problem that is causing a short circuit and the breaker is breaking. In that case, you, you can't fix it. Uh, or it could be that there's a problem further upstream. Like I had a show a few years ago where in the middle of the show we lost power and it turned out it was because like literally a car crashed into 
the, the telephone or the electrical pole outside of the theater and knocked it down. And it cut power to the building <laughs> uh, in the middle of a performance. And it's like, okay, well, I can't fix that problem. We have to just stop the show. Uh, so, you know, it just kind of depends on what happens. But hopefully the, the idea of the power diagram is first to plan how you're going to power things so that you can avoid the possibility of a breaker getting tripped because of something you did, right? If the breaker gets tripped because of something somebody else did, well, it's your problem, but it's not your fault, <laughs> right? You can't really, you know, it didn't happen because of anything you did and you can't do anything about it. Uh, so, it, you know, you still can't do the show, but no one's necessarily going to blame you. Uh, and maybe that's the best you can hope for in that situation. Uh, so, you want, so that's one thing the power diagram does, is helps you figure out how to power everything in a way that avoids the potential to, uh, to over uh, draw on a breaker, on any particular circuit or breaker. But then the other thing it helps you with is if you do have problems, you can go and look at this diagram and figure out, okay, how is everything getting powered? If, if only this bit of equipment is, is lost power, hopefully the power diagram would help you know where those breakers are and where that might be coming from so you know where to at least start looking to fix that problem. So let me take you through this power diagram. Uh, and I'll start just sort of from the, from the bottom. So like here is a bunch of stuff that looks like it's probably sitting at a tech table somewhere. So we have, um, we've got a couple of computers here. There's a little IBM laptop, supposedly drawing four and a half amps. I don't believe that. Um, that's really a lot for a laptop. Here's a little Apple MacBook, 1.6 amps. Amps is the measurement of, of, of how much electricity is flowing through the circuit at a time, okay? Uh, there's a couple of little lights that are doing 0.9 amps, and then there's a ClearCom base station that's doing 2 amps. So 2 amps is how much current that device pulls from the, system, from the electrical service when you switch it on. Yeah, Camille? Okay, how do you find that out, like how much each thing is? Does that make sense? Yeah, so like, there, there are a couple of ways. So certainly you can look it up in the spec sheet. Uh, and sometimes that'll it'll tell you, right? It'll say, oh, you know, this will do this. Usually in the spec sheet, it'll it'll say it in terms of watts. Like it'll say uh, this many, it, it you know, this piece of equipment, you know, pulls this many watts, you know, or uses this many watts when you when you turn it on. And you can use uh, a little bit of math to figure that out. So, uh, for example, uh, my uh, my MacBook Pro here uses an 87 watt power supply. Uh, so if I wanted to, and so assuming that I was running it, everything at full blast and it was util utilizing all of that, the, the watts is equal to the uh, voltage times the amperage, okay? So if I know the watts and I know the volts, the volts is 120 volts, that's what I get from the wall. So um, I could say, uh, 120 volts divided by the 87 watts, and I get 1.37 or 1.38. That's the amps. So that's the number of amps that my MacBook Pro would would draw off the power supply if everything was running at full blast. Okay. Um, so you either that that's so those are two ways. You look it up the spec sheet. It'll tell you. Uh, how many amps. If it doesn't tell you how many amps, it'll certainly probably tell you how many watts. You do that little bit of math and you can get the amps. The other thing you can do is, uh, not that this helps us right now, but in the lab, we do have a little device called a kilowatt. And it's a cool little box that you plug into the wall and then you plug your little, your piece of equipment into it. And it has a little screen on it. And uh, you turn the thing on and it'll tell you like how many watts, how many amps, all that kind of stuff that it's, that it's drawing off that circuit at that moment. So that's sort of like the last resort. If you can't figure it out, just use the kilowatt and it'll tell you. Uh, so what you can see here is uh, each of these devices is connected to something. And this little symbol, this little circle with the line through it, that represents, uh, you know, like an Edison connection. Uh, 
that you know, is just on the wall that you would use. In this case, it's using a, a little surge protector. Uh, and that, the little circle represents the connection, and then there's a little bit of wire. This little horizontal line here is what we would call the power rail, or the voltage rail. Uh, and that's how the surge protector works. So the electricity comes in, and then each of these uh, little connections just has, splices onto that, either with a little terminal block or a bit of solder or whatever, but it's, it's wire touching wire. Okay, so there's electricity available on this horizontal line, and we are tapping into that for each of these little Edison connectors that then plugs into each device, okay? So each of these things carries X number of amps, and a surge protector, part of what makes a surge protector a surge protector is that it has a breaker. You know that little switch that's on a surge protector? Uh, that switch is not just a switch. It is a breaker switch. Uh, and so usually they're 15 amps. So if you try to draw more than 15 amps uh, through the things that you've plugged into the circuit breaker, that little switch will automatically switch itself off to try to keep you from lighting something on fire. Okay? Uh, so what I've said here is this little symbol here is the symbol, this is a standard electrical symbol for a breaker, okay? So you've got a connection, connection, and then this little green arc represents that little theoretical delicate piece of wire that'll blow up, uh, even though now it's just a switch that does it, but we still use that sort of symbol for the thin piece of wire. So I've said here, this is a 15 amp breaker. So the max I can pull out this is 15 amps. And if I just add up, you know, the, the current draw for all these things that are plugged into the surge protector, it adds up to 9.9 .9 amps. So I am, worst case scenario, if I turn all these things on, I'm gonna draw 9.9 .9 amps off of a 15 amp breaker. I've got, there's, it's gonna be really unlikely that this breaker will switch itself off, right? Now this little symbol here is a switch. Uh, so, uh, I'm just using that to, to show that there's a difference, right, between the breaker and the switch. Because you could manually switch the surge protector on and off using a switch, but there is also a current breaker. Uh, even though technically in the surge protector, they are kind of together as the same thing, uh, electrically we draw them as separate things, okay? Because a switch and a breaker are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, and for a surge protector, you know, it's helpful to just be able to show that because some surge protectors have a little, a little reset button on them that's independent of the switch. Uh, so I've plugged that surge protector into another little Edison. This is, so because this has two lines, I'm saying that this is a duplex, meaning it's, it's like a wall box that has two Edisons on it, right? So that second line is for that, and I don't have anything connected to that. I'm just showing that it is a duplex box. And there's some wire that goes through the wall and that wire connects to a breaker inside of a breaker panel. And that's a 20 amp breaker. And I'm still only pulling 9.9 .9 amps, so I'm okay. And this little number next to the breaker, this number 16, that represents the breaker number on the panel. So you'll notice I've got this little, this gray box drawn around this section. That gray box represents the breaker panel. And that panel has a label on it called 64PP. So somewhere in the building, and I've made a little note here that it's on stage left on the deck. So if I go to stage left on the, on the stage deck, I will find a breaker panel labeled 64PP. Inside of that panel, I will find a breaker labeled number 16, and that's the breaker that is feeding my tech table. So if suddenly my tech table goes down, I know I can run to that breaker and I should find number 16, and if it's tripped, I can switch it back on. And then if it automatically trips again, then I know I've got a real problem. Uh, so that's the basic idea. Uh, and then you see that like this, this breaker panel, it's fed by a larger breaker panel uh, that has a 150 amp breaker. And I'm saying that that is the main panel for performance place and that you can find that in the amp room next to the dimmers. And I've got a few different breakers on that. There's a 400 amp breaker here that feeds my amp rack. There, and there is a 150 amp breaker that feeds 
uh, this panel down on the stage. Now, the other thing that I'm making a note here that it says I'm pulling to 22.49 amps. That's what I'm doing. But there are other circuits in that panel that feed receptacles other, where, other parts of the building that I'm not using, but other people might be using and I don't know about. So I'm just making a note to myself there that says, you know what, just because I'm only doing 22 and a half amps doesn't necessarily mean I am, you know, in the clear because if someone else is doing 122 something, 100 and some, 20, what would it be, 26, 27 amps collectively with all the other circuits, then we could still trip this thing even though I'm under, well under the capacity for the breaker, okay? Uh, so let me just take you through some of these symbols here. So here's, here's the symbols. This is just a, a symbol for a piece of equipment. You're going to do the equipment type, the make the model inside, and the number of amps that it pulls. And then these are a few different types of connectors for, uh, you know, power connections. So a single plex would be just a single Edison connector which you would probably use that for like a surge protector or you know a power conditioner in a rack or something. A duplex would be like that you know two, two gang wall plate that has two Edisons on it, you would do that. Uh, if you did like a quad box, you would use this symbol. And then this one you can use to um, signify something special. Like maybe this is a power con connector or, or some fancy twist lock doodad or something like that. Um, rather than making a symbol for all of them, you can just say, you know, most of the cases I'm going to be using, you know, Edison, and if it's something different from that, I'm just going to use this to indicate that. And then you should have, have a little note there that just describes what it is. You could say, oh, it's a power con or it's a whatever, just so that you know what it is. Uh, here is the symbol for a circuit breaker. Uh, let me show you really quickly how to make that little arc because that's something I haven't taught you yet. Uh, let me just move this out of the way for a second. So I would, I would, there's a couple ways to do this. I would use this little tool called ellipse. Um, and there's another one, I think. Actually, I think you can. There is one called arc, I believe. Yeah. So if you just type arc. It's going to say, specify start point of the arc. So I would say I'm going to go off of that little quadrant of the circle. Specify the second point of the arc. And I'll just say there. And then it's going to say, all right, well, where do you want to put it? And you can kind of manipulate this until you get it about the size you want. And then click. And then you just have to do a little trimming. So I can do trim there, and then I can get rid of that, get rid of this thing. And now what I would do is just take this and move it off of there a little bit, and you basically got it, okay? So that, that is how you would might, that's one of the ways you could make that. So let me put these back now. Okay, this is just indicating a switch. This would be uh, a lamp. The reason this is important is like a lot of our uh, power conditioners that we put into racks have built-in lights and the light draws a little bit of current. Uh, it's usually not very much, but you need to account for it. So if you do have a lamp or a light in your ETA or something, this is the symbol you use for that. And then, you know, just a little dot that's hatched and filled in that you can use to indicate the splices. Yeah, Bella? Uh, for this assignment, are we creating all of these symbols yeah. or are we getting a file? Yeah. Okay. So for the assignment, uh, I want you to add to your template all of these symbols. Okay, so you draw these symbols uh, so you've got them in your template. And then I want you to recreate this power diagram. Okay. Uh, and I'll give the, the power diagram is available, you know, on the Canvas page. 
which you should be able to, let's see here. It's not there, it's here. Um, um, Okay, so here's the assignment. So you're gonna add the following symbols to your CAD template. I am saying pay attention to line weights. So notice how I'm using line weights here uh, to make these symbols pop a little bit. And then I want you to make this power diagram. So you should be able to download that image, look at it, and, and recreate this as best you can. Um, so uh, that is basically the gist of this thing. Uh, the rest of this is just boxes and lines that you know how to do. Um, oh, here's this little line here. Let me show you what's going on here. You see this dotted line? Uh, so that's, in, electrically what's happening is this is actually three breakers that are tied together. So it's, it's three 40 amp breakers, but they all trip at the same time. So if one of them trips, all of them trip, okay? Uh, and so the dotted line is just being used to indicate that, that they're tied together. Now, how do you make a dotted line? Well, uh, you're, you just draw a line, any old line you want, okay? And then you can select it here, and uh, under the properties here, see this? Where it says line type. Uh, you should see some options here. If you don't see the type that you want, that you can say manage, and it'll pull up this little window here, and you can go in and hit load, and you can go in and find all kinds of different dotted and dashed lines. You figure out which one you like. Um, so like I can add this one in, and, and there it is, okay? So now I can just pull that in, select that line type, and now it's a dotted line. Okay, so you'll need to be able to do that. Let me see if there's anything else in here. I showed you the, how to do the arc. I showed you how to do the dotted line. Everything else, I think, should be pretty straightforward for you. To, it's all stuff you've drawn something similar before. Yeah. So I don't so much need you to understand this power diagram yet. Uh, that will come in time as you, you know, again, there's a, there's a whole class we have on audio electronics where you learn more about this kind of stuff, and in production you learn more about it too. So I don't necessarily need you to understand fully what this diagram is saying, but I want you to figure out how to draw it, <laughs> okay? Um, so that's the assignment, is to figure out how to draw this power diagram uh, and add all these symbols into your template so that when you have to draw other power diagrams, you don't have to redraw these symbols. Uh, any questions about that? Make sense for, for the assignment? All right. So, uh, so here's what we'll do. Uh, I will, I'll go ahead and stop uh, the Zoom conference now and the recording and everything, and I'll let you guys kind of work on this throughout the week. Um, and again, as you have problems, don't, you know, first of all, start working on it now. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me stop sharing my screen so you can see me better. There we go. So stop, uh, you know, do it soon. Uh, start working on it now. And uh, then uh, you can, when you have problems, you can ask, right? You can ask soon. So post questions on the, on the discussion page for the assignment. Uh, you can also come and visit me on my virtual office hours. Again, I will have Zoom running on that link that's on the homepage for Canvas from 3 to 4 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, you can just hop right on and I will be there. Uh, if for some reason, like I say, if something happens and I can't be there, I will send out an email and let you know, hey, today I can't do it. Uh, but my plan is to just be there 3 to 4 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, no matter what. Um, I'll just be sitting here doing nothing. I did it on Monday and no one came on. And it was a real bummer because I was super hoping someone would come and ask me for help and no one did. Uh, so again, I will be here 3 to 4 p.m. on this afternoon. So that's an easy way to get help. You don't have to worry about bothering me or, oh, is he free or is he going to get mad at me? It's like, no, I'm, I'm there. I'm literally sitting at my computer waiting to help you. So 
hop on and I'll help you. Uh, but also don't, you know, please use that discussion board. That way uh, you can all benefit from the answer if somebody you're struggling with something. Um, and then we'll look at these on Wednesday. Uh, I also just want to do a quick plug. This is not for this class, but you're all taking the other class for me, uh, which is ear training. So don't forget about Sound Gym while we're all at home. Uh, I'm also, every Wednesday at 2 p.m., I'm going to be doing a, a live Zoom demo of a game in Sound Gym to give you some tips on how to get better. So today at 2 p.m., I'm going to do a demo on DB King. So you, know, you can watch me play a, a round of DB King, and I'll explain to you how I'm figuring this out, give you some tips on how to get better at that game. Uh, because if you can get to level 15 on DB King, Peak Master, Distorted Reality, and Reverb Wizard, by the end of the semester, I will give you eight bonus workouts uh, onto your gradebook to make up for some slacking off that many of you have been doing uh, over the break. So if you want to join for that, you can. I'll record it. You can watch it later if you want to as well. All right, any questions? I couldn't help but notice that you disappeared off the leaderboard. Yeah. What I don't happened? Know what, I don't know what happened there. That was not me. Mm -hmm. That was Sound Gym. Uh, Got it. So, uh, I mean, I have a different kind of account than you guys have on our system. Uh, I have a teacher account, and it used to be that the teacher account would show up in there, and it doesn't anymore. So I don't know why. I don't really care. But, um, you know, if you I thought you just got tired of competing with Deanne, and so you decided <laughs> that you were, you know, you were over it. No, no, it, it, they, they, they pulled me off all by themselves. I don't know what happened there. But, you know, if everyone wants me back on there, I can see if they can put me back on. I don't really care. But um, if you want to know how well I'm doing, you can look at my public profile and you'll see it. Um, so, all right. Any other questions about the assignment or anything for this coming week? Okay, start working on it now. Don't wait until Tuesday, because <laughs> then you won't find out that you have a problem until late Tuesday night, and then I'm not gonna be able to help you. And you're gonna like send me an email in the middle of me sitting in my living room watching The Office, and I'm gonna be really annoyed because I will have sat like at my computer Wednesday, you know, Friday and Monday afternoon, waiting to help you and no one asked for help and then I'm going to be annoyed because I have to turn off Netflix uh, late Tuesday night and help you. So, all right, so ask for help sooner. All right, that's it. I think we're done. If there's no more questions, last call. All right, work on that power diagram and let me know if you have run into any problems. And maybe I'll see you at two for Sound Gym. All right, bye everybody.